Welcome to the Voices of Veterans podcast. I am your host, Dan Hamilton. As always, the Voices of Veterans podcast is brought to you by the Veterans Land Board and Chairman George P. Bush. Here at the Voices of Veterans, we promote the triumphs over tribulations of our veterans in the great state of Texas, and nobody can speak to that better than my next guest. I am proud to have here Jacob Schick. Jacob, for those uh, in the audience who may not know your background, uh, tell us about when you joined the Marine Corps and where you are currently, how you got from point A to point B. Perfect. Thanks for having me, Dan. Appreciate it. Um, honored to be here. I joined the beginning of my senior year in high school. I signed up. Uh, I didn't tell anybody in my family that I did. I was already 18, so I thought that was a good idea. And joined You're in at that point, so you make your own decisions, right? Yeah, right. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, know everything about yes, everything, yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I come from a uh, lineage of Marines, and so my grandfather fought World War II, fought on Iwo, uh, my uncle in Vietnam, and so I knew since the age of about eight I wanted to be a Marine because I was really close to my grandmother growing up, and uh, when she'd talk about my grandfather, she would like, light up and her chest would swell with pride, and so I had determined it as a kid if she's going to talk about me and do that when she talks about me, I've got to be a Marine. And so I decided right then that's what I'm going to do, come hell or high water. So beginning of my senior year, I was already 18, joined the Marine Corps, graduated in uh, 2001, volunteered for infantry and keeping my family lineage to be a warfighter, and then, uh, of course, 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. and so very sobering experience uh, for a kid who had no idea what war would entail or, or what would come with that, but uh, became very real very quick. You know? And so went to boot in uh, MCRD San Diego, yep. Uh, Hollywood Marine in more ways than one now and so I, <laughs> I didn't um, as if Marine Corps drill instructors needed any more motivation to be Marine Corps drill instructors they they definitely had it they hit their know. peak that's right being there a month after 9-11 yeah. it was uh, it was gnarly to say the least but wouldn't change any of it and then went to uh, school of infantry training up at Camp Hilton got done with that checked in with my unit and then not long after I checked in, my guys were actually at a Gitmo at the time, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, mm -hmm. doing uh, perimeter security. And then we, not long after they got back, we got the call. We all knew we were going to get. We didn't know if we were going to go to Iraq or Afghanistan, but uh, got the call we were going to go to Iraq. Did our work up at the Glorious 29 Palms. Oh, yeah. And uh, place. it is a beautiful place. I have a summer home there. <laughs> all right. <That's> <laughs> and uh, went to Iraq in the summer of 04 and our primary area of operation was the Sunni Triangle mm -hmm. and got hit September 20th, 2004, and then spent 18 months in the hospital, had over 50 operations, over 20 blood transfusions, got out, struggled with addiction, and then struggled with alcoholism, and um, here I am. Well, that I think is um, an interesting segue of uh, kind of the characteristics that we talk about at this table a lot, mm -hmm. which is it's not if you um, come into a challenging circumstance in life, whether you're a veteran or whether you're somebody watching at home who is not a service member. But what is important about your story, and I think what we try to bring out here to our audience, is that uh, veterans, when they encounter an obstacle, find a way around it. And you not only found a way around the obstacles that you faced, uh, drug, alcohol, addiction, um, suicidal thoughts, but you actually went on to go found or create something and be the CEO of 22 Kill, which is an organization that helps prevention of suicide and helps veterans come out of those dark places. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about 22 Kill and how that idea became a reality and then a movement. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in 2012, when the first study from the VA came out stating that on average 22 veterans die by suicide every day, there was a group of uh, warriors and a couple of businessmen that got together and said, hey, look, this is an epidemic. What can we do to make this known, make this a, where general population can understand this is an epidemic. You know, the more awareness, the more that it's out there, the more apt someone is to do something to change it. And so that was, uh, th there, there was first the 22 push-up challenge. And so, again, that started in 2012, went viral in 2015 or 16, so we were out overnight success. Yeah, and, uh, overnight success always takes time, Yeah, huh? Yeah, exactly. And it, it only happened after The Rock did it. 
you know, regardless of the tens of thousands of people that did it before, the mothers, the daughters, the the, yep, yep, that just uh, respect service, whether on the veteran side, first responder, law enforcement officer, uh, the Rock did it, and then it, it blew up, and, and we knew right then, because I, I took the helm at 22 kill in 2015, and we knew with that support and that, that big draft, that was, it was a significant change in support and awareness, and we, we had people coming to us from all over the country, and we knew, okay, we have to offer in-house services. We have to. We can't keep pushing these men and women off to other organizations, because then, two things, we're, we're not sure what the follow through is with them, the continuum of care, firstly. And secondly, uh, I couldn't answer respectfully to a donor when they asked me, hey, I gave you a dollar, where did that dollar go? Right. Because what was the impact of it? Right, so we were basically a uh, pass-through organization at the time, whereas now we are a fully operational treatment organization that offers in-house uh, treatment, which is both, we, we offer both traditional and non-traditional because you have to have both, because you're placating to a, a, various, a various group of people. I mean, the, at the end of the day, we're all made up of the same stuff, but different things make us tick. Sure. So we offer the one-on-one therapy program, uh, which is our state of the course program. We offer non-traditional, which would, for example, would be our forge program, which is outdoor hunting, fishing, hiking, et cetera, or our wind therapy program, which would basically learn how to ride a motorcycle through a partnership with Harley Davidson and JMP Cycles, and then we put together these big rides, and uh, and a how lot does, of things in between. So, how does it feel to to sit around, identify an idea mm -hmm. with uh, peers and business leaders, and then you see it catch on through social media, yeah. and then now you are providing the services through Twenty Two Kill in house. Yeah, is that did you anticipate the steps being like that? So. No. Basically, what I've done is, what I've learned is uh, I'm, I'm just going to be, and this is what I tell the tribe every day, if we can just show up every day, be present with compassion, absent of comparison, the rest is going to take care of itself. Right things, right reasons, respect the grind and grind forward. And so we, I really, that's why I hate the five-year, ten-year plan thing. Mm -hmm. When people ask mm -hmm. me, like, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, I don't know. Come holler at me in five years. I'll right, let you know if I'm where I want to be. There. Yeah, so because my thing is we just got to be present in the here and the now. And so the employees of 22 Kill work tirelessly. I mean, and it's by no means a 40, 50-hour week job. It's a, you wake up, you start your job, and your job stops when your eyes close. It's constant. And it is all day, every day thing because we're dealing with the human condition. We're dealing with the human soul. And that's something that takes an abundance amount of effort. And these men and women are all drastically underpaid and overworked. And what they're makes serving it, their cause, though. And that's, that's it. And what makes it successful is their idea is passion before paycheck. That's their conviction because they know what they're doing has the ability to go far outside the borders of this country in the realm of mental wellness. Let me ask you this. Has your approach to the organization changed now that it's established? Like at some point, yeah. you have an idea, you mm -hmm. see it, you see it impacting people, and then maybe the impact is either different or yeah. not what you expected. Yeah. Um, tell me about that. Yes. So um, in a multitude of ways, I'll touch on two. A, because I've you know, I've lost uh, 30 of my personal friends to suicide, and uh, I know stunning. eight. I know, and I, I know eight that were killed in combat. And so the fact that it's been, and not to mention my own struggles of suicidal ideation and anxiety and hypervigilance and depression, et cetera, et cetera, everything else that uh, everyone else has struggled with, they just rather they talk about it, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> but it's uh, you know, for the last few years before I got sober, I really, I was the one showing up, leading the charge and the party in and all that, and like, hey, let's go have a good time. I mean, you know, and I, I, it was hard to get the tribe to really respect me when I was like, hey, this was serious, we gotta be serious, and then two minutes later, I'm, I'm pounding a beer or something. Right. But when, you know, you make that abundance change, it was after one of the, the last losses we have, and when I say losses, I don't mean in victory or loss, I mean loss of life, mm -hmm. because it's not, we didn't make that decision for them. You know, we work with humans who are going to decide to take that Their path. Their own fate. That's right. 
You know, and that's why I tell people, you know, 22 kilo is not our job to stop the suicide ep epidemic. Uh, two reasons, there's God and we're not him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's our job to empower these men and women to give them the tools in order for them to help themselves. They have to do the work. We can't do the work for them. And so I think that approach where I got sober and I, I got more clear-minded, I was able to, to effectively lead from the front. Where I, Otherwise, I wouldn't. I may have thought I was, but I wasn't because I wasn't. I wasn't addressing my own demons in a healthy manner, and so therefore it mean it made me a fraud. And so I needed to put myself in check and understand that if okay, if we're going to do this fight, and we're going to do it the right way. I got to lead from the front effectively to be an effective leader in this fight for the greater good. And so, you know, I made that change, and and a lot of a lot of changes have come with that. And and secondly, it's 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 played out on a daily basis, almost the way that. Um, that I thought it would because in-house, within the tribe of 22 Kill, we, we truly do lead with love and we love, I mean, our whole thing is love and be loved. And in order to do that, you have to be brutally honest. You have to be And so is that what you had to do with yourself in order to make the change I, I, within the organization? Absolutely. Yeah, it started with me. I mean, it's my sword to fall on. If I didn't make the change, how could I expect anyone else to? It's just like when men and women come to me or they end up in my office, they're like, Jake, I don't know why my husband or my wife or my brother or sister or boyfriend or girlfriend, et cetera, won't love me the way that I love them. And I'm like, you know what, if you can't look in the mirror and be truly in love with that person looking back at you, how do you expect your husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, to love to you love the way you, you can't love yourself? It's a height of hypocrisy. So if you have seen your own personal circumstances change, Mm -hmm. and you have imparted those lessons to the people at 22 Kill, mm -hmm. to the people that you come in contact with. Have you seen the, the circumstances or the conversations outside of you improve in the way that you desire? Yes, to a degree. Uh, I believe within the organization, within our entity, um, it, it's, we've gotten very effective at effectively communicating. Because I always tell them there's a big difference between communication and effective communication. Mm. Anyone can communicate. Very few people can effectively communicate because that takes brutal honesty with oneself first. You have to be really, you have to dive into depths of your soul that you don't want to dive to because you know where it's going to lead. Right. You know there's going to be pain there. But that's okay. And everything we've ever wanted is on the other side of our fear. Do you think veterans are, are more comfortable uh, going to that place then? Is that the improvement you've no, seen, which is veterans are more no, willing to... No, I believe, no, at, not at all, because it's a human issue. It's not a veteran issue. It's a human issue. I agree. That's a good point. And so at the end of the day, what people need to understand is we don't just help veterans and first responders and law enforcement officers and their families. That We don't deal in just veteran first responder LEO issues. We deal in human issues. The humans that we deal with just happen to wear a uniform and be related to someone who wore a uniform sure. at one point or another. That's what we have to understand. So that... You know, to answer your question, yes, we're ge it's getting better within the warrior culture. Are we where we want to be? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because this is a global issue when it comes to the human element. I know, I'm glad you said that uh, this is more than just a veterans issue. Because at the Voices of Veterans podcast, I think one of the most uh, powerful things that we can do as veterans is impart the ideas and the struggles that we have mm -hmm. uh, to our peers in society who may not serve. Because if we are the ones who have borne the battle scars and we have learned the most difficult lessons, the point of this podcast is to impart those lessons to everybody else in society mm -hmm. so that they don't have to go through those struggles. Or if they are, they can listen to somebody like you to say, hey, these are the ways that you need to go about uh, solving a, a, a difficult issue that you're in, but it is so true that the issue we're talking about at this table is something that affects uh, American families, families in Texas all across the spectrum, regardless of if they're in, in the military community. That, you're absolutely right. And that's the whole point, where we are now as a nonprofit organization is, and I'll just be very candid and put the cards on the table, I mean, they're already on there anyway. That's right. Yeah. Is that we're, we are utilizing veterans, first responders, law enforcement officers, and their families as the tip of the spear in order to implement systemic change in the mental wellness realm. You have to have a group. Okay, any major movement that's ever happened in this country or any other country has started with a specific group. Mm -hmm. Well, we are mostly alpha-minded men and women, alpha-minded personalities that tend to not shy away from confrontation. 
And when we get together collectively, I mean, that's why we're World War Champs, but when right. we get together collectively, <laughs> it, we're unstoppable. But we have to be brutally honest with one another and ourselves first. And so that's the whole idea, is that if we utilize these men and women, get them together, and we say, hey, look, this is the mission, this is what we're going to do, and Let's it's go solve this thing. And it's going to get real uncomfortable because we're going to have to talk about the hard stuff. We're going to have to talk about the real stuff that affects everyone. And it's okay to not be okay. But let's That's a key element right yeah. there. So I'm going to ask you one more thing before. I want to transition uh, to talk about your interest in movies, your work in movies. But, mm -hmm. but before we get there, so I think that one of the most interesting things I've talked about in the veterans community is that because we view ourselves as warriors, uh, when we leave the service, we don't necessarily uh, view ourselves as a part of a sales team or as a, a part of a staff mm -hmm. or a brother or a sister. Mm -hmm. Was there at some point when maybe you felt like that warrior mantra was actually a, a detriment to you now that you are no longer in war? Or were you able to apply the warrior mindset to your circumstances when you were no longer in service? Uh, it's a great question. Yeah, the, the, it was a detriment to me for sure when it came to, um, because when I got to the hospital in Bethesda where I went first, I had to have a therapist come see me, and I made it abundantly clear I had nothing to say to a therapist. Mm -hmm. And um, same thing when I got to Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, it was the same thing. Like, I let it yeah. be known, this is a formality, and we need to check the box because I have nothing to say to you. Right. Whereas now, and that was and that was a warrior that coming was one hundred percent the warrior because, as you well know, uh, as a warrior and as a United States Marine, neck up issues is our no, that's a no go zone. Mm -hmm. Neck down, we can address. Right. If it's in between the ears, keep it to yourself. yourself. That's showing weakness. And keep going. That's right. And so now it's uh, completely different. But I still use the warrior mentality and the warrior ethos in order to work through those hard things. That's something I think that we have hand up with you know John Doe or Jane Doe in society right. because we do have we do have a group that we can lean in and love hard on I mean there's I know you have men women that you mm -hmm. can call no matter what that will drop what they're doing and come to you and it's the same for me but I don't see why that has to be limited to just the warrior like sure. we we should that should be available to every single bipod on the spinning ball of chaos mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea behind the One Tribe, One Fight movement with 22 Kilos. Hey, let's all do this together. Is it a strong name? Yes. So is cancer and AIDS, and we talk about that all the time. If we can't talk about suicide... We can't shy away from it. Right. And that's the thing, is we can't go around it in order to fix it. We have to go through it. So as somebody who was going through uh, the struggles that you were, you used uh, your evolution within the warrior mindset, which... You kind of had to, uh, to use the warrior mindset to actually get you through some of the difficulties that you were going through. Mm -hmm. But uh, through that evolution, uh, you have also adapted uh, your life and your career to a different circumstance um, after, uh, after service. And you have actually uh, been in a couple of movies, some very high profile movies recently. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's kind of change the spectrum here a little bit and talk about uh, one how, how did you get into Hollywood? How did you get into the movie making business? Uh, just because I'm drop dead gorgeous is really. That's clearly it's the beard. Yeah, I mean, yeah, once they saw the, the beard and the hair, they were done. It's the camera like, loves get me. Get this guy I mean, out of here. Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it's interesting the way it all happened was uh, when my, my introduction to, to the entertainment realm was when uh, the Commandant, Commandant Hagee at the time, mm -hmm tried to present me with my medals in Bethesda, and I just had an 18-hour surgery the day before, so I was still, when you're under that long, it takes, even when you're out of anesthesia, you're not out of anesthesia, it takes a while to come out of it, and you're groggy, and so I was coming out of it, and he walked in with his entourage, as you know, the yeah, commandant yeah. does not travel alone. And he does not travel lightly. And he had the, my, my metal case open, and um, he took a step in my room, and I saw him out of the corner of my eye, and I said, hey, sir, with all due respect, I'm not accepting those from you, not now, not today. And you know, I said, you might as well about face. <laughs> and he closed the case and about face and walked. He said, very well, Corporal Sugar. Close the face, close the box, about face, walks out. And the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, Spider Nyland, came in. And he had been coming to see me weekly. And he would sit down by me and say, hey, Jake, don't even look at these stars. Brother to brother, talk to mm -hmm. me. And it was a real level. It was a real connection with him. 
And he came in and he said, Jake, what the hell was that about? You just boss the bosses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, hey, sir, uh, you know, no disrespect. While it would be an honor to receive my medals from the boss of bosses in the Marine Corps, it would just, it wouldn't have any meaning. It would be a photo op. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to wait for my CO to get home with all 154 Marines I've deployed with. Mm -hmm. And I'll get the medal, the, the medals then, because with they're our voice. medals. They're not my medals, they're our medals. And then it will have meaning. And he said, that's good to go. He's going to love that. I said, I don't care if he loves it or not, sir. I that's what I want to do. I don't care. Yeah, and so that's what I did. Well, I word thing. got to I mean, HBO was looking for some people for this uh, documentary that uh, James Gandolfini was doing, Tony Soprano. Yeah. And, and so one, one, one of the employees at HBO had a family part member part that worked at the Pentagon. Well, apparently the story had gotten out that, hey, there was a Marine that refused to the Pentagon. And, um, so they wanted to come see you, huh? That's and that's what happened. So they came to see me, and the next thing you know, I'm in this documentary with Gandolfini. It's a live day memories home from Iraq, and then you know they loop it on like Fourth of July or uh, Veterans Day mm -hmm. or days that it's okay to be patriotic. <laughs> and then um, so then the casting director for American Sniper saw it and contacted me on social media and said, we would like you to read for this role in American Sniper. Well, I'm very close to the Kyle family, and I called Chris's brother, Jeff, who's a mm -hmm. fellow Marine. I said, Jeff, are they making a movie about Chris's book? He's like, yeah, man, it's Clint Eastwood's directing it. Bradley Cooper's playing Chris. And I was like, that's not going to work. There's no way. And then, <laughs> yeah, um, like, there's no way this is going to happen. No way. So, but that's how it all started. And then next thing I know, I found myself in Los Angeles on a, on a movie set to... You know, a, a movie being made by a living legend about a legend past. What did being on a movie set on a day-to-day -day basis teach you, um, maybe that you could apply in in day-to-day -day life? The, just to relax because absolutely nothing is under control. Hmm. You know, I mean, that's the thing is we're, we're so good at BSing ourselves into thinking that we have all of this under control, we have everything, and it's like, no, no, you don't. So it taught you the ability to live yeah. and let live? Yeah, and, and to be, to just wake up and do me because everyone else is taken, you know? Like, I'm just going to do me because that's the only thing I'm really good at. I yeah. suck at everything else other than just being just myself. Just being yourself, yeah. And so I, I, that's what I was doing, and that's who I was, and, you know, it was well received. I'm sure a few people were uncomfortable, myself included, but it worked. Did you notice a change in yourself, though? Because if you, if you consider yourself through that warrior mentality, and you're a veteran, you're the CEO of 22 Kill, all of a sudden you're, uh, you know, with movie stars and you're in Hollywood, mm. totally different environment, Completely totally different. different expectations. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of interested in that evolution because I, I think veterans need to know or people on active duty need to know that just because they see themselves in one way doesn't mean who they are can't be applied to different scenarios. Absolutely. And you just kept the door open to yep. opportunities that came your way. And so that's the thing, is that we have to understand, and not only as warriors, but as humans, that we do not have to, we do not have to allow societal expectation to limit our greatness. We, we do not have to cave to societal pressure. We do not do you, mm -hmm. just live, and live well. Is that yeah. what provides you the most freedom or confidence absolutely because i don't give a damn what someone else's opinion is of me because it's none of my business and here's the thing when i die there's going to be a line of people at the funeral that love me there's going to be a line that hate me and i have no no control over either line and so i i'm just gonna i'm gonna keep doing what i can do to the best of my ability with the resources i have available in order to make an impact mainly to leave this world better than i found it for my sons who have to grow up in it and hopefully make be driven to make an impact because you know it's like I've told I tell my boys you do not have to wear a uniform to be of service to your nation mm -hmm. you know just wake up and go out of your way not to be average what is uh I'm going to change directions here a little bit yeah what's the, been the importance of your family mm. uh and your boys oh man yeah I wouldn't be here though straight up fact I would be uh I would be a either a statistic or um, I would not be here 
I, I would either I, I'd be dead or in jail if it wasn't for my family. Family is just that yeah. important too. It's kept yeah. you going through the difficult times. Yes. It's giving you purpose. It's yeah, and I think it's important to know too that it's not you know it doesn't have to be blood relation. Like when people say, mm -hmm. well, you can pick your friends, you can't pick your family, and I'm like, hold my salad and watch this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's that's the thing is we have to surround our people with better. Our, we have to surround ourselves with people that are better than us because by default we're better. Yes. By default yeah. we're driven to be to work harder, be better, do more, and that's the thing is it's. Uh, I I need to surround myself with those people that will hold me accountable regardless of how uncomfortable it is because I may or may not be a strong personality. They respect that I will handle it accordingly in order to make an adjustment to be better because that's what we have to do. Anyone that brings toxicity into our life, they do not need to be in our circle for long. Because if you are a fixer or you are a healer or you feel like, well, I'm gonna let them keep doing it because I can help them. No, you can't. No, you can't. And the importance of your family is they have been able to keep you steady yeah, through the ups and downs. And, and that's the thing is when I, even in my addiction and my alcoholism, there was a lot of them that wouldn't that knew it was a problem but wouldn't really say anything because it's like, well, yeah, he's been through so much. And it's like, so what? You know, pain mm -hmm. and suffering, is, there's no Richter scale on pain and suffering. It's all relative. Everyone here, everyone in this office, in this building, in this city can relate to mental pain and suffering. It's, that's it's a the human thing. condition. It's absolutely a human condition. That's why I always say the two objectives from the time you're born to the time you die, love and be loved. What makes life hard? Human element, free will. Well, I want to thank you for being at this table today. Thank you for uh, not only sharing your story, but sharing your life uh, with our community, with the people here in Texas and, and the people across the United States of America. I think it's uh, you know such an interesting uh, evolution and story about your character to be able to persevere in difficult circumstances. Uh, for our audience at home, I want to thank you again for joining us. It is always a, a blessing to be able to come and talk about uh, veterans who are overcome trials. We hope that you're able to take some lessons from the conversations that we have at this table, share them with your friends, share them with your family. If you know someone who is hurting, if you know somebody is in a dark place, I know Jake would echo this also, give them a hug, uh, send them a text, give them a call, and be in community with them, be in fellowship with them. Jake, for our audience who would like to follow your journey over the coming months and the coming years, where can they find you on social media? Uh, on Instagram and Twitter, it is Jacob underscore Schick, S-C-H-I-C-K, like the razor, no relation. I got screwed on that deal. You did. And uh, Facebook is just my name, Jacob Schick. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate the conversation. Uh, if you've enjoyed our conversation, as I said earlier, reach out to a friend, reach out to a family member. Also, thank you for coming back and uh, being a part of our conversation here at the Voices of Veterans podcast. Please give us a like, please give us a share, and we'll see you next time. Follow us on Instagram at Voices of Vets, on Twitter at Voice of Veterans, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Voices of Veterans. To hear more, please visit VoicesOfVeterans.org. Join us in sharing the success stories of Texas veterans. Thank you for joining us for the Next Gen Warrior Podcast.